It all began with a diplomatic breakdown when North Korean and US leaders met in Hanoi. Now a frustrated Pyongyang has resumed firing missiles. So what message is it sending? And can diplomacy still reduce tension on the Korean peninsula? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Once again, Kim Jong-un has put the US and its neighbors on high alert. It happened after Japanese and South Korean defense systems detected projectiles being launched from North Korea. Critics say that Kim is using his military complex to send a political message just a week after he traveled to meet President Vladimir Putin in Russia. That action's adding to already mounting tension after Trump and Kim's failure to reach an agreement at their summit in Hanoi in February. But South Korea has quickly asked Pyongyang to restrain itself. A spokeswoman for the presidential palace said that it urged the North to stop action that intensifies military tension on the Korean peninsula. She also said the launches go against an inter-Korean military agreement and North Korea is expected to actively join efforts towards the fast resumption of denuclearization talks. Well, in less than two years, President Trump and Kim Jong-un's relationship went from name-calling to holding two historic summits. It all began when Trump accepted an invitation from Kim while holding talks with Seoul. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo visited Pyongyang soon after to set the ground rules for a Trump-Kim meeting. A month later, South and North Korean leaders held a historic meeting which ended in an agreement to denuclearize the peninsula. In May that year, Pompeo visited Kim again, returning to the U.S. with three Americans who'd been detained in North Korea. Trump then announced that they'd meet in Singapore. After brusque exchanges between the leaders, the first historic summit was finally held on June 12th, and both men signed a denuclearization commitment agreement. Kim began to dismantle rocket launching sites, although he wasn't obliged to disarm. In February, both leaders met again in what became known as the Hanoi Summit. Kim's nuclear weapons were top of the agenda. However, that event was cut short, ending without a deal. Joining us for today's discussion are guests via Skype from Busan, Robert Kelly, Professor of International Relations at Busan National University, and from Beijing, Aina Tangan, China political analyst. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Robert, let's start with you. Professor, what is North Korea up to here? I think this is probably a signal to the United States to come back to the table and negotiate. Um, it's pretty unique in North Korea's experience that a negotiator, Donald Trump, would sort of just get up and sort of walk out of the room. Um, the North Koreans aren't accustomed to that kind of behavior. They usually get deference after they pull some hijinked or stunt. And I think when Trump did that, it kind of sent a message and the North Koreans are sort of pushing back the way they normally do. I do think Kim Jong-un wants a deal. I do think they are genuinely open to something with the Americans. And this is a way to sort of needle the Americans a little bit to get them to come back and renegotiate. All right. Aina, do, do you agree with that? Um, this was essentially about concentrating minds in Washington. Well, it, it might be about concentrating minds and uh, uh, trying to get some attention, but uh, there's a number of other things that are in play. Kim is desperate for a security um, ag agreement, a cover, that will guarantee his, uh, his rule and his country. And that means either the U.S. or and or a combination of Russia and China. But at this point, we're in a very, very difficult position because, quite frankly, uh, Donald Trump is painting himself into a corner where he says he's not going to give any money or make any concessions until there's complete denuclearization. And it's impossible for Kim to give up his nukes because it's the only thing that he has as a bargaining chip. So while it may gain attention, it's not necessarily going to be very productive. It's uh, surely going to ratchet things up. Obviously, South Korea is in between, and that's the unfortunate part about this. So, I know was, was there any significance in the timing of Saturday's projectile launch? Yes, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, a few hours prior to that, there was an announcement that 10 million uh, North Koreans were in essence starving and that this had been the worst uh, crop harvest in quite some time. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a good way of changing the narrative for Kim. He's both sending a message at least 
uh, to a lot of commentators out there. They believe that he's sending a message. But I, I think you could also interpret it that he's just trying to change the narrative. Uh, instead of t talking about uh, 10 million people being hungry, now the headlines read projectiles thrown into the sea. Robert Kelly, you say that the, that the North uh, wants a, a deal of sorts. Uh, to what extent is Trump messing this up? Is there, is there a certain arrogance at play here? Yeah, I do think the North Koreans want a deal, right? And I've, I've actually argued this in my, my writing. I think Kim Jong-un is different than his father. His father really did run the economy and the country into the ground and sort of had very mixed feelings at best about dealing with the outside world. And the son, grandson, the third Kim now, seems genuinely more interested, right? He went to Singapore, which is sort of extraordinary. He wears banker suits and stuff like that. I mean, the Kim, this Kim has sent a bunch of signals to us in the West, broadly speaking, that he wants some kind of deal, right? I mean, he's tried, he's talked to the Chinese, the Russians, Donald Trump, the South Koreans, and so on. So I think there's some space. Now, I agree the North Koreans aren't going to go to zero. They're not going to completely denuclearize, right? They've spent 50 years developing these weapons. Presumably, they have several dozen warheads. Now, they're not going to give them all up, but they might be willing to give up some. Right. And the real question here is, will the Americans come forward with a deal that the North Koreans find acceptable to maybe give up, I don't know, 10 or 20 or 30 or something like that? And this is where I think the Trump administration has really sort of dropped the ball, is that the Trump administration just hasn't come up with a package the North Koreans find very attractive. Instead, they seem to demand everything, complete denuclearization up front in exchange for these sort of vague security guarantees and, and sort of economic um, aid packages and stuff like that. And that's just that's just not enough. And the analyst community has been flagging this for a year and a half now. I mean, the Trump people don't listen to us, I suppose. But I think a lot of people don't actually think the North Koreans are going to come around until Trump gives more. And he seems loath to do so. But when you talk about more, Robert, I mean, what is it? What, what would a deal look like? Uh, I mean, uh, should the denuclearization process go both ways as far as the North is concerned? Um, I talked about that arrogance, is this sort of arrogance that the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. there's this assumption that North Korea should just bow to, to the U.S.'s demands without offering at least some sort of military concessions in return. Yeah, and I think that's really the problem, right? I mean, the Trump administration's approach to this has been basically, you know, our way or the highway, right? Which is sort of it's what, the, what the Trump people and, and before them called CVID, complete, verifiable, irreversible disarmament, which is to say that North Koreans would give up everything, not just the, the nuclear weapons and the warheads, but the physical facilities, the human capital, the whole bit. I mean, maybe even the uranium mines. I mean, it's just a, it's asking for everything for the whole show and the North Koreans are pretty smart, right? They're canny, they, they're not gonna give something for nothing and the more you ask, the more they're gonna demand in return. And the Trump administration needs to be sort of imaginative here. The North Koreans are gonna want a lot. Obviously, they're gonna want sanctions relief. They're probably gonna want a huge aid package. They'd probably like to see a restructuring of the force posture of the US and South Korea, of the South Korean military. I mean, they want a peace treaty. There are lots and lots of things the North Koreans want. And the, the Moon administration, to its credit, has at least flirted with some of this stuff, the, the South Korean president. Um, but the Trump administration has really only offered sanctions relief, and, and that's just not enough for the regime security value of nuclear weapons. It's just, it's just not enough. The Trump people have got to come up with more, or we're going to have to learn to live with North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. I know. What sort of deal would China want to see? What would be acceptable, preferable, as far as China is concerned? China takes, a, I think, a slightly longer view. They're looking at this as a, uh, you know, over years that you go from phase one, two, and three, and that eventually that uh, North, Korea, uh, North Korea feels uh, comfortable enough giving up its nuclear arms. I don't know if that's uh, possible. I mean, uh, let, let's not put all of the arrogance on one side. I'm no fan of Trump, but on the other hand, you have young Kim, who is, whose state is, <laughs> in fact, uh, under UN sanctions, who has successfully met with three of the world's top leaders in the last year. And it's, uh, you know, the idea that somehow North Korea will dictate that the U.S. will uh, drop its nuclear weapons and uh, uh, umbrella over uh, the Eastern uh, Asia is a, a bit much. So uh, basically, you have two individuals here who are very stubborn. They believe that they should have their own way, and they're in positions where it is almost impossible to strike a deal. Now, enter, entering in with China and Russia, it is possible that China and Russia could go ahead by uh, offering a security guarantee, uh, either one or both of them, and thereby start the process without the U.S. Uh, there would have to be some triangulation in the sense that the U.S. would have to declare peace. And then uh, I think, uh, quite frankly, uh, Donald Trump would be relieved 
if this was off his plate and he can say he successfully got the U.S., I mean, uh, Russia and China to do his dirty work for him. A wry, a wry smile from you there, Robert, I see. Yeah, I think that's I think that's based that kind of cynicism about Donald Trump, quite honestly, is well earned. I, I think the president has proven himself at best an erratic counterparty throughout this entire thing. I think the president's primary interest is domestic political, which is to say he wants a win. He wants the perception of a victory on something that's important so he can use it at home to change the subject from the Mueller investigation. He can sort of manipulate it as a tool in the presidential election last year. We know that he strong armed the Japanese prime minister Shinzo Abe into nominating him for a Nobel Prize. Right. I mean, this is, I think, one of the reasons why this thing just hasn't really worked very well is that Donald Trump just isn't really that personally committed to it. Right. He's doing it for opportunistic reasons because he doesn't like Barack Obama, for example, and things like that. I mean, it's it's really sort of shallow. And that's why the president didn't really prepare very well for the two summits. That's why he didn't really have anything in his back pocket ready to go. when Kim rejected CVID, as everybody thought he would at Hanoi. I mean, the Americans have just been just just haven't really brought their full game to this thing in the last year. Does it matter, do you think, either way to Trump voters, whether whether the president manages to negotiate a deal or not, whether he succeeds or fails? I mean, it's still a win-win situation for him, isn't it? Yeah, and the president's voters have some, almost like a cult-like attachment to him, right? I mean, he said he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't make any difference. I mean, so maybe it doesn't make any difference. And if that's true, then I would imagine the president will drop this pretty soon, right? But what's, I mean, the, the point is that he's just not going to put the work into this that's necessary to bring this deal over the line, if you think about sort of like big thing, like big major presidential initiatives in the United States for big foreign policy changes, like um, Jimmy Carter and Camp David in the 70s, or when um, George W. Bush sold the Iraq War to the American public, it took a really long time and it took a lot of presidential effort and commitment and bureaucratic coalition building and stuff like that. And Donald Trump just hasn't done any of that for the reversal of the relationship with uh, an Orwellian tyranny, right? I mean, if Trump is going to change the relationship we have with North Korea to sort of turn it upside down. He's got to build a coalition for it. He's got to make an argument for it to the bureaucracy, to the Defense Department, Congress, the analysts, the public. And he just hasn't done that. And that's one of the reasons why this thing seems so, so flimsy, because Trump just hasn't put in the effort, quite honestly. I know. Um, one more question to you. Before. We've got a third guest to bring in in just a moment. But uh, I, I just want to ask you, uh, going back to what you were saying a few moments ago about uh, President's, uh, President Putin, uh, what happened two weeks ago between uh, Kim and, and Putin. Has whatever Putin said to Kim emboldened him? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, don't, I, I, I mean, Putin is his own uh, animal, as they say, uh, but I don't think he's trying to uh, stir the pot uh, with North Korea. It's a dangerous game for him as well. I, I think uh, all the powers are pretty united in, in doing this. But uh, having said that, I mean, Putin has been fairly uh, dogmatic about trying to uh, take down the existing uh, international order ever since he gave his speech at the uh, Munich Security Council many years ago, uh, indicating that he felt Russia had been betrayed uh, in its uh, treatment uh, and in its breakup after the USSR promises had been made and broken, this type of thing. Uh, but I, I would add one more thing to my colleague's uh, statement, and that is it's almost impossible for anyone to rely on Trump. He, he tears up treaties with abandon, uh, you know, he, he tweets it out and this type of thing. And because it's all about politics, you, you can't be assured that he will follow through with a treaty. And this is what Canada and Mexico are finding out. Uh, they signed uh, the new NAFTA only to find out that uh, the uh, other restrictions and tariffs were going to remain okay. in place. So he, he doesn't carry a high amount of credibility. It's really difficult to see that he'll be able to get anything done on a diplomatic basis. Let, let's bring in Aidan Foster Carter then, honorary senior research in, uh, researcher in sociology and modern Korea at Leeds University. Aidan's also authored several books on uh, Korea. Good to have you with us, uh, Aidan. Um, you missed the beginning of, of, of the discussion at the moment. We're talking about uh, President Trump uh, with an eye on re-election. To what extent do you think it's in Trump's interest to let the North Korea situation go south for a while, perhaps picking up on it at some point nearer to the election? Uh, it is so hard to predict. Um, the irony is that in, the, the, in Clicheville, the North Koreans are always called unpredictable, and I would say not a bit of it. They calculate every move very carefully, so they chose to fire these projectiles. They chose to fire not the biggest projectiles they have. The one who is unpredictable, as has been said already, is Donald Trump. Um, who knows what level of interest he will sustain in this? 
But the trouble is, the, um, the, the, the firing by North Korea today is a wake-up call. Kim Jong-un is reminding us, and I think we can all agree with him on this, that the situation on the peninsula is now unstable. The Hanoi uh, debacle, the second summit was clearly... We probably don't want to go into that in huge detail in post-mortems, but it, it clearly didn't work. Nobody got what they wanted. And somebody now needs to make some sort of a move to bring people back to the table again. We could then discuss in what form. Um, so I really hope it will get Trump's attention and I hope he will not react negatively. He seems to think he has a personal relationship with Kim Jong-un. One might feel there is something a little bit delusional about this bromance or at least insubstantial. But I'm kind of glad he feels that because otherwise I'd be worried we'd be back to uh, 2017 and fire and fury and little rocket man. And that's, you know, that we really must not get back to there again. Aidan, the, the, the North has demanded that, uh, that Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, be removed from... Uh, any nuclear negotiations. What's Kim's problem with Pompeo? Uh, I think the particular, again, it's hard to know, but I think the particular thing that may have riled them is that on some, he's usually, I think, a fairly smooth TV operator, but he did get sort of slightly entrapped into calling North Korea a tyranny, which, of course, objectively it is. It's just that if you're, you know, if you're engaging in diplomacy, you maybe avoid words like that. Of course, this is a, an, an, an un, unallowable demand by North Korea. You do not tell the other country, your interlocutor, uh, who may or may not represent them. And if somebody holds the office of Secretary of State, you would expect them to sit down there. Um, I think they can find ways past that if they are minded to. Um, the point is that everybody's a bit bad tempered at the moment, uh, particularly North Korea. And if some, it's very worrying for South Korea too, uh, President Moon Jae-in, has been working very hard to be a mediator. I mean, it was he who brought them together, who made this all possible last year. And now uh, Kim Jong-un is dissing him for meddlesome mediation, which I must say seems extremely unkind. Somebody needs to find a positive way forward out of this. Otherwise, I fear where it will go. Uh, Robert Kelly, is, is a third summit possible, given all of this that's going on? Yeah, I think so. I think the president still is hoping for some kind of deal, some kind of victory, you know, get his Nobel Prize or something like that. He has invested a fair amount of effort in this, you know, less recently, but he has put in some, right? What does he have to lose? He's not going to prepare for it the way he didn't prepare for the last two. It doesn't make any difference to him. He just gets on a plane and flies to wherever it is. Um, and I think Kim, I do genuinely think that Kim is looking for a deal also. I mean, he does keep trying. Now he wants a deal on his own terms, but I do think he's at least open to it in a way that his father wasn't. So I would imagine there will be a third summit, but I would imagine it will also be small beer in the way that the last two were. It'll return some kind of vague joint statement. But unless the Americans come forward with something a lot more substantial in exchange for fully verifiable disarmament, the North Koreans are going to balk. Do you have any sympathy, Robert, for North Korea? I mean, they, they seem to have been doing all of the running. I mean, at least they seem... Uh, I don't know, more genuine, genuinely interested in doing a deal than the Americans do at this stage? I wouldn't say sympathy. I can understand why the North Koreans rejected the deal that Trump offered them, which is basically give up everything you have in exchange for vague security guarantees and some aid packages and a Trump Tower and that kind of stuff. I mean, Trump talking about condos. I mean, you know, I mean, if you're the North Koreans, are you going to take that seriously? No, of course you're not, right? You're surrounded by countries that don't like you, right? Many of which would like to see you eliminated from the system altogether and nuclear weapons are just simply there they're a great deterrent against the sort of local security threats and nothing trump has put on the table comes even close that's not to say that north koreans made a good deal to us to the americans they didn't either right I mean, if you look at the two deals offered in hanoi they're both ridiculous right and that's why you know maybe if we're gonna have a third deal maybe we should try something smaller something a little bit more dual because at hanoi it was so obvious the two sides are very far apart uh, i know does Donald Trump listened to, to regional powers and the advice that they offer. I mean, power, a big power like China, um, as he appears to do with, with Israel and Saudi Arabia in the middle, of, middle East, he, he, he takes the advice of coming from those countries over and above uh, the people in his own government departments uh, sometime. I mean, is, is he listening to, to China and to what Shinzo Abe of Japan says and, and South Korea? No, he isn't. Uh, he's uh, listening more closely to Putin, as we found out in the last day or so, uh, which is a strange idea, given that his administration has identified him as a culprit in the, uh, in the last elections. But this idea that there's going to be a third uh, summit, I, I find hard to believe. 
Uh, the North Koreans were humiliated. Kim was personally humiliated by Trump walking out of those, uh, of those meetings. There would have to be a fairly solid deal on the table and it would just be a signing. Uh, this is also uh, something that is um, a concern of Beijing. And they're not letting Xi go to the uh, Mar-a-Lago without something in concrete. Uh, you never know if Trump's going to pull something at the last moment, but that would not be received well. And this goes to this issue that you just really don't know how to deal with Trump. He's not trustworthy. He's not somebody who believes in the process. He believes in the art of the deal, which is the moment. He's completely transactional. So um, very, very difficult to see this going forward. Aidan Vostokata, what, what does all of this mean for uh, Japan? Will Abe meet with Kim, as he said that he wants to, and would that help or hinder the situation? I think he might, and I think that if it happened, it would help. I mean, we are in quite a curious world now, given that uh, the, the US and North Korea have had a couple of summits, which never happened before, and anything is possible. And uh, Kim Jong-un, who I think played the whole thing very skillfully last year. I'm not so sure about this year. Um, what he has done is, is made himself a reputable figure on the international stage. And Abe, having been very hard line uh, and still basically being very hard line, now that he might actually be left out. So he's the last one. What uh, Kim Jong-un has met Xi Jinping four times, uh, the South Korean president Moon Jae-in three times, Putin twice, uh, sorry, um, Yes, no, Trump twice, Putin once, and spot the odd one out. Abe hasn't had the meeting yet. And in theory, I mean, it's been on the table a long time. If North Korea and Japan ever were to establish diplomatic relations, Japan would pay compensation for its colonial rule over all of Korea in the first part of the last century, and billions of dollars could come Kim's way. I mean, it won't be easy. There's a very specific issue about historic abductions that's never been solved. But uh, I, you know, Kim, along the way, Kim Jong-un might play the Japan card and then it will put Abe in a very interesting position. Uh, he, is, he keeps reiterating that he would do it. We'll have to see. Robert, what's your view on that? On Japan, yeah, I do. I think that Kim has nothing to lose by meeting with these other characters right in the region. I think that's why he's sort of shopping around looking for a deal. Um, he's got the nuclear weapons, so why not try? Again, I think that, you know, again, he's different than his father. Right. Um, go and meet the Japanese next. Right. And if you can play these various players against one another, China and Japan and Russia and the United States, right, all of them jockeying for influence, right, you can get them competing and then you get better deals from all of them, ideally. Right. And this is something that um, the first Kim, Kim Il-sung, was expert at during the Cold War. Right. And I think the nuclear weapons give Kim Jong-un, the current Kim, space to basically play the countries around them, around him off against one another and see what kind of deals come out from the mix. And if he doesn't get anything, then he just hunkers down and he just waits with his nuclear weapons until all of us adjust to that reality. And I know, Tag, in, in Beijing, how is this going to play out, do you think? Are we going to see a deal anytime soon in Trump's first term, the remaining days of his uh, first term, whether, of course, he's re-elected or not remains to be seen, but uh, are we going to see a deal sometime in the future? No, I don't think so. Not not with this particular cast of characters. And I, I, I don't really think that a meeting with Abe, even if it is had, will have any bear any fruit. Uh, the idea of Abe, who is a, a nationalist, who a revisionist, who's trying to resurrect the glory of uh, uh, you know, pre-World War II, uh, saying, uh, doing all of these things, changing um, the Constitution so he can have an army, so that he can uh, pay billions of dollars in war reparations when they're not even willing to say that they're truly sorry for uh, what they did to the comfort women. I find that a little bit uh, hard to believe. Gentlemen there, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it. Many thanks to all of you, uh, Robert Kelly, Aidan Foster Carter and Ina Tangen. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time just by going to our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for being with us. I'll see you again. Bye for now.